Okay, I think we'll begin. Hello everyone, welcome to the Sound Arts Lecture Series for the Autumn Term. My name is Mark Peter Wright, Acting Course Leader on the BA Sound Arts and also a member of CRISAP, Creative Research into Sound Arts Practice, a centre that's also based at London College of Communication. Um, I'm really happy today we've got Yolandi Harris uh, going to be giving our artist talk um, and I'll read Yolandi's bio and hand over shortly but as always in true repetitive style I will go through um, some housekeeping notes that we do each week um, before we begin um, and the first thing that I always say is that this is a wonderful arena really because it's um because it's full of public it's full of BA MA and PhD students it's very mixed um, offer and so within that mix please as always UAL students just do use your full username so that we can identify you if you're an external member of the public also please um, put your full name as your username if we can't identify you then you may be asked to leave um, I'll say this second point first because I just heard some lovely microphone rustling. Just keep your microphones off um, unless um, we need to do otherwise. Um, and we can obviously put microphones on for the Q&A if needed. Um, but just be mindful this is a public forum and the chat message is functioned, uh, is archived, sorry, part of that. The session's always recorded, as you know, and can be reaccessed on Moodle for students. And actually the, the archive for this term is building up really nicely. So you know, if you do miss these, it's, you can catch up on them very easily um, on Moodle. So specifically for our students, here is your attendance QR code for today. You can scan that with your phone. The password is YDXOAV. And again, I'll pop that in the chat for everybody. So if you don't get that, don't worry, um, I'll do that when we get started. And yet again, wonderful opportunity to speak to contemporary artists and thinkers. So get your questions going, use the chat actively. Again, it's lovely to use it as a sort of log um, of, of interactions as we go, as well as questions. And we always sort of state that a question can be um, simple or it can be just something about a topic you're interested in finding out more overly simple. So log your chat questions as usual. If you want to ask them vocally, do drop me a private message. It would be great if um, you come on the mic and, and ask your questions directly, um, because it's quite a unique opportunity to do that. If not, I will pick them up as usual. Um, and go through them. I think someone's got a microphone on somewhere. So, I'm very, very happy that Yolandi is with us today, and um, I'll read Yolandi's bio and then hand over because um, there's so much more wonderful stuff to come. Um, so Yolandi's work explores ideas of sonic consciousness, using sound and image to create intimate visceral experiences that heighten awareness of our relationship to the environment and other species. Her artistic projects on underwater sound encourage connection, understanding and empathy with the ocean. Yolandi is Associate Researcher and Lecturer in Digital Media, Art and Electronic Music at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and Lecturer in Digital Media Art at San Jose State University, and was previously Assistant Professor in Film, Animation, Video at Rhode Island School of Design. Yolandi has presented her work internationally um, in all sorts of places. I won't read too many of them, but things like the House of, Culture, House of World Cultures in Berlin, um, the Exploratorium in San Francisco, Ars Electronica Festival and many, many other places. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear about today through uh, the artist talk. So, Yolandi, thanks again. And I'll hand over to you from here. And just as a reminder, use the chat function, everyone. Um, we'll pick up the questions primarily at the end of the session, um, although some can obviously get weaved into the talk if necessary. Thanks, Yolandi. Hi, thank you, Mark. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm just gonna share my screen. 
Let me just check actually that I did share my sound correctly. Yes. Okay, let's see. Zoom window's in the right place. <laughs> Lost my mouse. One minute, there's my mouse. Okay. So let's see, sorry, Zoom issues. Okay, here we are. Um, all right, so um, hi, I'm joining you from Santa Cruz in California, which uh, it's very early in the morning here. It's just 6.30 a.m. and the sun is not up yet, but it, the sky is getting light. Um, so I'm just really delighted to be here with everyone and able to share my work. So I always find that, you know, when I, when I share my work, one of the things I like to do is present what I've been thinking about in, in ways that allow you to experience it. So hopefully, um, you know, questions or impressions or feelings will come to you through the experience of the work. Okay, so I'm very open to any questions you have at the end. Um, and more than a sort of a theoretical analysis of it, I will, uh, you know, be playing quite a lot of examples. Okay, so that's the sort of approach I decided to take with this group. Um, I'm just going to start with this one which is silent, so don't worry if you don't hear anything. So this piece is called Light Entering My Room, and it is a way of taking the light that falls through trees and lands on a surface, for example. Sometimes you see it when it filters through trees into your room, and looking at those patterns. Um, <clears throat> This is actually in the Pacific Northwest of the United States, um, in Washington State, up in a in what's called the the a rainforest. It's a it's a temperate rainforest, and so many different species of plants in this forest, and um, extremely damp and wet, very rich um, diversity there. And so this is the kind of shadows. Instead of seeing the actual forest, you see just the shadows of the light. And the reason I show this to you is because I think of sound as more than just sound, yeah? More than sound as in something that we hear with our ears, all right? Um, I think of sound in relation to the other senses. Um, so here I think, you know, the, our, our sense of sight appears to me to be quite sonic in this sense. Um, and I, there are other situations that I think of as kind of sonic, and they are related to the weather, for example, related to color. That's another area where it's less something that's um, tangible, physical that you could hold or spaces you could be in, but more um, yeah. kind of a sense of environment, a sense, a sensation of, of being within something that is, um, that is more, um, well, let's, let's stick with the word sonic for now. Okay, so when I talk about sound, just as we go through this, remember that I'm nearly always talking about this relationship between the sound and the image and our experience of those. <clears throat> so this is how that was installed in an exhibition back in 2015. And you can just see um, the projection on that corner wall there. And it was actually surrounding you around the backspace um, with other pieces in the distance. <clears throat> Someone, someone's unmuted. If you could mute. Can we? Somebody. I'll just wait. Yeah, just hang, hang fire if you land. Okay, uh, sounds good. Yeah, sounds good. That's fine. Okay, so um, so this so this area is instead of having a um, an image on the wall in some sense, is really much more fluid uh, as an experience that you walk through without bounded bounded edges, if you like. Um, I 
And remember, this piece is actually silent, so what you're hearing is sounds from other pieces around the solo exhibition. So just, just to give you an example of that, and this, um, it, it reminded me, and I went back to a very old piece back in the early 2000s that I did, um, where I started to uh, build instruments, particularly with vid for video and live sound which was quite tricky in the early 2000s. Um, I worked at Stein in Amsterdam to um, to studio for electro instrumental music there to, to build different instruments. And this was a piece um, called Walk in the Woods. And we were trying together with um, a, 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 a collaborator of mine, we were trying to carry projectors and a backpack with a heavy battery and walk around in different ways. So this gives an example of that. and. Um, trying out different kinds of images and pay attention to how the image it's not just uh, like a flashlight or a torch it moving through the dark woods but it's overlaying imagery on top of that and then pay attention also to the sounds and this was in um, Catalonia in in the north north of Spain Jump ahead. So again, interested in how um, our perception of the environment changes and can transform by placing different elements in it and how that relates to um, to the sound and the space that you're actually in. And you could hear a nightingale there in the background. Um, and the imagery um, kind of disappears and sort of um, blends into the to the forest in a way that you, you can sometimes make certain things out and it's kind of an overlaying. This is going to come back when I talk about displaced sound. So another piece um, <clears throat> uh, that I did in 2009, this was part of my doctoral studies that I uh, completed in um, at Leiden University and the Orpheus Institute in Ghent. Um, and it was called The Pink Noise of Pleasure Yachts in Turquoise Sea. I always call it Pink Noise. And it was about the um, experience of um, noise pollution or sounds that were happening under the water while on the surface it was this pristine um, area of natural uh, the natural preserve in the Balearic Islands in Spain. So I managed to get a hydrophone, it was my first work really with the hydrophone, and drop them beneath the boat that I, could, that I was on and record the sounds of all these different yachts coming in and all the engines and the different anchors dropping and the, um, the different kinds of sounds, the echo, echo sounders depth sounders, things like that, and it sort of um, combined them in this way, in this installation where you walk on to this projected area, which is this beautiful uh, color of turquoise and pink light, and looking down through the surface of the water to the weed beneath. And then you put these headphones on that you see in the middle of the screen there, and you hear the sounds that are underwater. So kind of a <clears throat> a kind of a hanging and a sensation of being immersed, but through this looking down situation. So I'll play a little bit of that sound for you.
So just to give an idea that, um, you know, that was, that's the kind of sound, it, it was unedited, that was one section of a, P, of a longer recording that I selected. Um, and you can see uh, and hear the, this contrast between the perception of this pristine, untouched environment and the sound that's happening because of the visitors in these boats. So I became very interested in, um, uh, in noise pollution, anthropogenic sound underwater and how we are and how sound travels underwater, how what a different environment it is. So um, and, and bear in mind that this sound can travel uh, at high speeds um, and far greater distances than on land. So um, it's just entirely different. And because somehow because we can't see it, <clears throat> excuse me, because we can't see it, then there's a sense that it's not there. Yeah. And I think that that's the case with so many things, you know, to to make something um, experienceable, yeah, to to create something that you, one can actually experience of a place that you cannot otherwise access or something you cannot specifically see in some way uh, that's beyond our senses. Yes, um, that that's an important thing for us to be trying to do to in, in order to enable us to experience things that are beyond our perceptions, our human scale perceptions. So this was like a sort of start start of this um, idea of underwater sound. <clears throat> At the same time, I was working a lot with the ideas of navigation and specifically um, at, the, at this time, it sort of started around 2007, working with GPS, early GPS work. So the, the global positioning um, system, uh, GPS that we are all so familiar with now, um, was available, but it was something that was not available on phones, for example. So you had to buy a separate device um, and uh, and work with that. So um, as a as a sailor from from uh, from birth, I guess, <laughs> um, from my family, we were always on boats. And so sailing in, in the ocean has always been very central to to my experience of life. And it's been sort of a the ocean and, and the, the difference between a sort of a, um, a, a terrestrial view of things and and the one that comes from the ocean, sort of an oceanic perspective, or uh, is is something that's always been in tension with me, within me. So I've explored that in a lot of my works. Um, and th these two pieces that you see here, one is those three prints along the wall, and the other is um, the the round projection, video projection at the, at the on the side there. Um, these were exploring navigation and. I was taking GPS and taking GPS data and turning it into different kinds of maps and turning it also into sound. But in order to do this, I was um, <clears throat> I was looking at the difference between um, the GPS system and uh, older styles of navigation that that were developed in the Western world, which were using um, instruments like the sextant. So celestial navigation, measuring through the stars and uh, and calculating through tables and these measurements of the sextant during the day and, and through the stars. So that's what I taught myself how to do, um, which was quite an interesting adventure in itself. And what you see in the video piece, which I'm just going to show you now, um, is the sextant view. But the one in the print in the middle of the three on the wall is called um, uh, it is it's an it's called anchor, and it's the GPS trace of a boat on anchor over a period of about forty eight hours, and just to show you that piece um, that it shows the how you know the anchor is holding, but the trace itself is constantly moving. So it's then taken from early Google Maps and then Google Earth and then sort of superimposed on this area. So um, so that the trace, this ambiguity of traces and the ambiguity of GPS and, and where we think we are, our sense of location, things like that were very important in this, this whole series. So this is the piece um, navigating by circles and it's the looking through the eyepiece of the sextant. You can see the sun. I'm trying to line up the sun with the, uh, the horizon, the line of the horizon. <clears throat> And what you hear is uh, the sounds of sonified data that I created from the GPS data. So 
So I want to show you this because um, I want to draw your attention to the way that everything is constantly in motion. Yeah. So this sort of irony of um, trying to locate a specific, uh, a specific point and trying to fix that. And yet by doing so, you recognize that everything is constantly in motion. The sun's in motion, the boat's in motion, everything. Okay. And, and you know, time is passing and, and these sort of tensions between the, the actual felt experience and this desire for sort of fixed knowledge was very important. So this took me to a piece called Sun Run Sun, which is based on that technique of, of taking uh, sextant sightings uh, around midday to try to locate your position um, in the ocean. And I created these um, small handheld instruments. You can see the, the woman in the center with the headphones on has in her hand a little device, again, that was built and developed through STEIM and the Netherlands Media Art Institute in Amsterdam. Um, and the, the, the idea here was to create something that you could walk with that would take satellite data live, GPS data live, and turn it into sound as you walked. So this is really not useful for navigation in terms of it's not going to tell you where you are or anything like that. So it kind of subverts those expectations of what navigation is. And um, it, um, it takes the GPS data, but not just location like XY data. It takes the signal strength of the satellites. Um, it takes their position in the sky um, and it transforms them into very simple sounds. Um, bear in mind that this was hard to do at the time, 2009. So I created these sounds that were just um, just manageable for the little processor that, that was that is in this tiny little thing. We could do much more complex things now, but um, so this is the, let's listen to it. So just to give an idea of, um, sorry, hang on a second. <clears throat> just to give an idea of the kind of responses that people gave, which I found as fascinating as the piece itself, perhaps more fascinating, was the kind of um, sort of kind of sense of wonderment in a way of like, what, what is this? What am I listening to? Um, somebody saying it's, it's a sort of feeling connected to a world out there. Yes. Something bigger than yourself. You feel like you're surrounded by something that is creating these sounds. Um, people wanted to buy it. They felt it was connected to their heart or their, um, or their steps or their breath, like the, the actual body rhythms. Um, so these sort of very different reactions came about um, in the experience of it. So that became really part of it to me to explore why that might be and what was really happening. So I, th I think I'm just going to continue from that one because I want to get through quite a few pieces today. Um, <clears throat> so this the sense of kind of um, shifting your expectations of where you are and how you are moving through space, how we locate ourselves by a felt experience, as opposed to, I know I am here now because the GPS or the map or, or my address or anything else tells me that I'm here now. Yeah. Um, so a, a really a felt experience. Um, and the um, displaced sound walks for exploring that a bit further. So all this is is it started as a workshop and I really still do it as a workshop, much less a performance or show or anything like that. And I have a set of binaural microphones that sit um, in or over the top of, of visitors ears and little, um, you know, 
uh, field recorders. Yeah, here somebody's holding a Zoom recorder, whatever's available. Um, so you're getting a very good stereo impression from the two microphones by your ears. And you um, go out and you walk around for five minutes of a, a route of your own choosing. Yeah, and you just have to remember the route that you've taken. So you walk for five minutes while making a recording with these binaural microphones. You then come back um, and you sit down and listen to those record recordings, not moving, just stationary. You can listen to them. And then the final step is that you listen to those recordings while making the same walk. So exactly the same walk. Um, five minutes is about the maximum and you listen to the recordings instead of, um, you know, of, it, so your headphones are replacing the sound around you. And um, it it sounds, you know, incredibly sim simple, like, well, so what? But the, but the reactions that happen are really interesting. So people will, for example, put the headphones on, walk to the door, reach for the door handle and hear that the door handle is opening just before they get to it. Or they'll walk down the street and they hear footsteps behind them, but there's nobody there. Or they'll pass a, 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 a walk down the street and suddenly a bus starts its engine right next to them, and there's no bus there. Yeah. So there are um, people will walk towards them and their footsteps will be out of sync. Um, various things will happen that are sort of like phantoms or ghosts within the environment. Um, and it just creates this awareness of how crucial the actual listening is as we move through the environment. And if you just take that out of sync slightly, so you're in the same place, roughly the same time of day, only a few, you know, 15 minutes different, 10 minutes different, but that can be everything in terms of how you're actually experiencing the environment. People would feel like the, you know, wobbly or they put their foot down at the wrong time and be and think, oh, but why why am I out of sync? Or certain sensations, really physical sensations, and just to draw one's attention to that experience. So those are the displaced sound walks, and I've done those many many times with many different people, um, all all over the place because it's so simple to do and so and and really fun. So another piece here, Mississippi tornado. So I moved to the U.S. in two thousand and twelve. Um, and I, I started off in Memphis, Tennessee, and this, is, which is on the Mississippi River, and so I was very fascinated by this river. Um, and looking at it, this drawing is something that I made from um, from maps and tracing maps. And what it shows is the river as um, as it used to be. So there are two, actually two lines there, and and and, and colored in. It is that is the difference between these two lines and the river of course changes so uh, over time as rivers do yes there's a river delta and the river will change course um and you know it's a it's a shipping route so they will they will um, cut off corners if they become too long to make it quicker various different things but the idea is it's also a political boundary between two different states one side of the river and the other so as these um as the river has changed um, and sort of loops of the river have been cut off and made a, a shortcut if you like through suddenly a piece of arkansas the state of arkansas is floating on the other side of the river then, then the and and so Mississippi and Arkansas, the kind of political border, which is this very fixed, um, rigid structure, doesn't really fit the the actual fluidity of the river and this border that is much more uh, flexible and and movable. So with this image, um, if you can see it in this, this is the solo exhibition again. Um, if you see in the back, there's the image drawn onto the wall. So it's like a long line down the wall. And um, with these headphones hanging, I created a piece that is a field recording, direct field recording in from Memphis. Um, and I walked out one night in terrible storm, a lot of rain, and there were all these sounds going on, and I didn't know what it was. It turned out to be the World War II sirens that they now use as a tornado warning si sound. And it kind of floats through the rain and through the environment in this incredible way. So I'm just going to play you a little bit of that.
Okay, so to jump out of that a little, um, <clears throat> uh, just to get a feel, again, that was a, a, a field recording, it's unedited, and it was really surprising to me that those kind of sounds floated, they felt like they were floating through, um, through the space and really, the, it's kind of like, they sound like they're electronic sounds. It sounds like it's a created, composed piece of music with a field recording. It's not, it's really how it sounded. So to be in that space um, was very uh, mysterious and powerful experience to, to kind of be feeling that. So um, let's move to, I'm just seeing a few in the chat. No electronics added at all. Absolutely not. So, so there was nothing in there. It was really just uh, the sounds of the of the sirens kind of floating through. So, um, <clears throat> let's look at this next part. So, what I've got here is learning from underwater sound. So, I want to dive into further into this idea of of underwater sound and uh, you know where I've gone with it. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know how many of you are already you know very interested in underwater sound if it's new for some of you if it's if it's already you know something that you're very familiar with so i'm not going to give like a, a whole <clears throat> introduction to elect to underwater sound but i'll just show the pieces and how i've tried to engage with with ideas through it and these were two questions that actually came out of my dissertation re research um, and that have sort of kept steady through the work that I've been doing. I keep I keep coming back to these questions. I think they're still relevant. So how can our conscious listening affect the world around us? How can learning to listen to underwater sounds transform us and transform our relationship to the environment? So the sense of transformation by listening to a space that we otherwise cannot access. Yeah, a space that is um, outside of the human, uh, you know, sensory domain that we can that we can um, access. So um, without technology, yeah. So let's move on. Let me see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are some underwater sound recordings that you're hearing, um, and I'll play many more. Mm -hmm. oh. You know, what what is this environment that that covers most of the planet? Yeah, and how can we understand more about it? So one of the things that I have also been doing since a young child is swimming, um, often in very cold water. And I, I understand this is quite an English thing because <laughs> I did grow up in in the UK on the south coast in Devon, and. Um, and so swimming has been, you know, quite important to me. This is a piece called Swim, where I'm really looking at the, the rhythm and the nature of swimming through, a, through the, the kind of a direct experience of it. There's kind of a, a ripping sound as you, yeah. As, your ear kind of surfaces above the water and then dips down and the, the rhythm of this difference and how your eye just peeks above and sees the, the horizon and then back down again. So this sort of idea of surface was very interesting and how the swimmer is playing on this surface um, and experiencing it in these different ways. Another one, this is um, sailing and to see again um, let me just talk before you hear it. Um, see again, the sense of motion that this is a sailing boat, so no engine here. This is uh, propelled by the wind through a pretty rough um, sea. Just feel the sense of, of motion and, 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 uh, and how that might feel.
Well, I hope that didn't make you seasick, but you, so, I mean, you get the idea of everything is in motion and this, this kind of a sensation of, of, <clears throat> of motion is just so different from the terrestrial. And, and we know that, but it's so hard to experience what it's like on the ocean unless you go, unless you spend time there. Yeah. Um, so what happens beneath this surface then became really interesting to me. Um, and I'm going to show you a piece now called Listening to the Distance. And this piece was called Eagle. And I made this in the Puget Sound around Seattle, um, up in the North Pacific Northwest of the US. Um, and the place that I had a studio had a it was high up and looked down over the Puget Sound, which is this very deep um, inland waterway. And there were these uh, a dead tree where these eagles, bald eagles perched, and I would watch them and, um, and make work about them. So there's a pair of them hanging out. And the sound that you're listening to is something completely different. So um, the idea of listening to the distance really intrigued me. Let me let me see. Let me keep this one on for now. Listening to the distance was was a, was something that I was playing with to say, OK, I can look into the distance by using binoculars, for example, different um, <clears throat> different visual aids that can bring the distance closer to my vision. Yes. So I can look at these birds that were far down in the corner and I could use binoculars and I could and I could look uh, really clearly see them in much more detail. So that would be looking into the distance, but then what happens to listening to the distance? If I want to get up close to them, like I can with a, with a visual apparatus, how would I do that with a microphone? And the, it just highlights the difference between hearing and seeing. And so um, the microphone, of course, you know, you get a uh, you get a more sensitive microphone, but then it picks up everything <laughs> more. Yes, uh, you can try and get a very directional one, but still it's not going to get you closer in that sense. So I really had a feel of the difference between listening to the distance and um, looking at the distance. And I use these birds as uh, as a way of kind of entering that space. So. Um, <clears throat> so what you hear in that um, what you hear in, in that sound there is um, the sound of a of an it's underwater sound of a sea glider, which is an um, underwater robot, basically, um, that is sent out. It's probably about six feet long, um, human size ish, and it's sent out into the ocean for months at a time collecting data. So they program a GPS track and it tracks back and forth across, you know, kind of combs the ocean, collecting the data and um, and it's used for scientific research. And in collaboration with the scientist Kate Stafford at the University of Washington, I managed to um, use this sound. She was the first to put um, a hydrophone, which is an underwater microphone, a hydrophone onto this sea glider. Um, and when it came back after these months, she said, you can come and listen to it, but it's useless for us because what it had picked up was all the sounds of the actual um, operating sounds of the of the sea glider itself. And she was hoping it would pick up um, sounds of whales, which is what she was studying. So um, I then used this sound because to me, it felt like I was sort of able to place myself in this very distant environment. And because I could hear something of the workings of, the, of this machine, I was able to give it some kind of sense of presence. The sound actually gave the sea glider a sense of presence and this remote ocean. So you're hearing um, the combination of those two. And I'll play a little more in just a minute. So um, here's the installation. And this is the second part of that video where um, which I'm just going to show you. So it's projected full full size, very large. Um, and this is how it looks. Um, so this is a close up looking through multiple lenses. So I zoomed right in through layered lenses, binoculars, um, cameras, in many steps, and it creates these kind of halos around around the bird's face and head and feathers, and it's paired with the sound of the sea glider. So we'll, we'll just listen and watch this a minute. So <clears throat> along with that, 
um, I zoomed in even further with the imagery onto the onto that image of the bird here. Um, you can see its feathers and beak and various things and and I zoomed in and created these prints. These are large size prints, um, inkjet prints. But then these, these, for example, are the feathers. So zoomed in so far, you see the pixels and the gradients within the pixels. It's this really beautiful kind of um, imagery. And this is the, uh, the beak. This is around the ruff of the neck, but where the ruff, the white ruff meets the feathers. Again, this is where the ruff meets the, uh, meets the sea behind. You see that the colors and the halos and the, these these different the different way where and this is the eye. So as you zoom in through this technique and zoom in in the in the software as well, you, it starts to get less and less distinct. So then that's where I come back to this idea of color and sound and these ideas where they start to reach a similar similar sort of um, zone, if you like. So that, that was the eagle piece, listening to the distance. Okay, so let's um, let's move on to a few more. Yeah, I'm doing okay with time. A few more pieces of underwater sound. So I included um, a couple of quotes here from, and this one's from Ania Lockwood, and I'll just read it to you. Um, <clears throat> the If I can get past my Zoom windows here. For some reason my mouse just disappears, which is <laughs> not very helpful. Okay, I'll just try to read it. The Mobius strip of expanding aware awareness moves out from from I can't read it unless I get rid of that. Hang on a second. Why does my mouse disappear? Sorry. I'm kind of stuck. We go. Let's move that. <laughs> okay, now I think I can do it. <clears throat> Let's try again. Okay, so the Mobius strip of expanding awareness moves out from one's own body to immediate place to other phenomena onto remote environments and back to the self. Um, in Harris's Rich Body of Thought and Art. These are powerful works in concept and realization. The sense of interdependence which they evoke and encourage is vital to our transformation into good stewards of our environmental neighborhoods. So I included this because of Ania, Ania Lockwood's own work in sound and environment and how um, important that is to her ideas of using sound and listening. Um, so it's a sense of inter interdependence. It's not, it, it's related to, um, you know, we've we've talked. I've talked already a little bit about um, the sense of one's own felt experience and one's own body, but in relation to these much larger um, structures of environment. So um, that becomes sort of that is key to the works that I'm showing here. So I want to talk about these this piece called. Um, these headphones, which is uh, around the idea of whale walks, I would call them kind of, I just refer to them as whale walks. Um, and here are the five braided headphones, I'm going to show you a little about those. So this first piece was about um, a piece, a place, a piece that I was commissioned to make in Dundee, Scotland. Um, and it was for um, it was about the whaling history of Dundee. That was what it was about. It was supposed to be about. So what would I make about the whaling history of Dundee? And I did a, a, a whole load of research on the whaling history and its relationship also to the jute industry. So there were it's two industries running side by side in Dundee. Uh, one was whaling, which involved these ships um, and needed rope that was made by the jute factories. Um, and the jute factories, in order to make the rope, needed the whale oil. So there was this kind of cyclical um, uh, thing going on between the two the two industries. Um, the men were the ones that went on the whaling ships, and the women run the jute factories. So there was this also a kind of a gender um, roles going on there as well with the two industries. So I learned how to um, create. Uh, this is a sixteen strand hollow braid. 
that would be used, it's a Celtic technique, this one, this particular braid, and it would be used to wrap something with a solid core to it. So, um, you know, wrap some kind of part of a boat, for example, that needed wrapping. And, and, and here I'm wrapping headphones with it. So I figured out how to make this work. Um, and there I am braiding using this technique. Um, <clears throat> And here it is in Dundee itself. This is on Shackleton's ship that he took down to Antarctica on one of his missions. And it's up in Dundee Harbour. And the place where the um, where the piece was to be shown was on the harbour wall front. And one of the one of access was to this ship, the Discovery, the RMS Discovery. And here is one of the visitors wearing the headphones sitting on that um scientific vessel of exploration western exploration around the world which was uh, you know such a you know talking a lot about about exploration shipping um and the west's move throughout throughout the world in these in these ways sort of kind of placing it in that zone was really interesting um and here is another visitor on the edge of the harbor wall in dundee looking out across the firth there and um, what you hear are the sounds of the um, of the whales that would have been brought in on the ships. So I again asked Kate Stafford, the professor at the University of Washington, I asked her what whales would they have hunted, and uh, you know in where would they have gone in the Arctic uh, area that they would have gone from Dundee? What were the species that they would have hunted, and do you have sound recordings of them? And she brought back these sound recordings for me. And there are beluga whales, there are humpback, uh, not humpback, sorry, um, bowhead whales, um, bearded seals, and narwhals. So those four. And in the background, you hear ice. So there is a lot of crunching and booming and cracking, and that is ice. Um, and so thanks to her recordings, I created this 30 minute sound piece. So you walk around with these headphones um, and, and can sort of imagine as you look out the animals the voices of the animals that were brought in dead not alive as we hear them now and so sort of allowing this um this um, voice to be reheard in some way So that was just um, a sort of a short section of the 30 minutes and they were mainly bearded seals that you were hearing with the ice cracking. Um, but, you know, I think uh, voices are crit critical and to be able to hear them gives them a sense of presence that otherwise they don't have. So that was part of that experience. Um, so this, the second quote that I wanted to put in here was from Brandon LaBelle. Both of them wrote um, wrote catalog essays for, for the solo exhibition that I did. And so that's, this is taken from that. Um, so about this particular piece and the idea of the, of the whale headphones um, listening to the whales while walking. Um, so he says, you're invited to walk, letting the sounds of whales envelop us in their watery, deep murmuring. These sounds are at once distant from our earthly territory, our terrestrial senses, while they in turn immerse us within their sudden proximity. The immensity of the sounds, the great depth and dimension of their sonority, are brought right up against our skin, delivering all this depth and resonance into our listening. So, um, you know, I love 
Brandon LaBelle's writing and ways of thinking about sound. And I really enjoyed this, um, this piece in this piece of writing in that he's talking about bringing, uh, bringing these sounds, these enormous sounds right up to against our skin. So the again, the contrast with, um, with scale and with place that we can get um, um, with with this kind of experience. So <clears throat> So this led me on to a piece called Melt Me Into the Ocean. And this I did when I moved to Santa Cruz, California, which is on the Pacific coast of California and right on a, a bay called the Monterey Bay. And the Monterey Bay is very deep. Um, it has a deep, deep canyon that runs into it that is deeper than the Grand Canyon. Um, and it is a, a national marine sanctuary. It is full of migrating life and very rich in biodiversity. Um, and so this is where I live now and where I um, decided to explore what was happening and research what was happening in the place that I live um, in, in this particular area. So what I did was get in touch with a group, uh, a scientific group called um, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, MBARI. Oh, hello, that's my doggy. Um, and, and they have a, an underwater station, um, scientific um, uh, lab, basically, um, down deep in the canyon. And one of the instruments that they have down there is a hydrophone, a mounted fixed hydrophone that is um, recording at incredibly high, uh, f high levels of uh, fidelity, and it is cabled, so it's running straight to the shore 24 hours a day. So from this, they can listen continuously and then analyze that sound using different AI techniques to find out the animals that are in there, different kinds of shipping noises, different kinds of um, uh, seal bombs, fishing, fishing um, explosives that they use, various different things. Um, and so I asked if um, I could have some of that audio um, and they were uh, very helpful. John Ryan there who works there um, lent me some of those sounds. And so I created a walk that is um, takes you from along this pier that goes out to the lighthouse um, in Santa Cruz, this little lighthouse. And as you walk, you start listening to the sounds that are very close in. So under, they're all underwater sounds and you're listening to crustaceans clicking and boat engines of different kinds, um, <clears throat> various different sounds like that. Sea lions, there are sea lions here that bark underwater, um, different sounds. And as you gradually walk along, you get towards the beach you get further out past the beach and the breaking waves and out into the ocean. So you're sort of surrounded by ocean and um, looking out into the bay where these hydrophones are and you hear the deep um, hydrophone recordings. So there are many whales. There's, um, there are humpback whales. Uh, there are blue whales, which are these very, very deep rumbles, which you can just hear on the headphones. Um, there are clicks, echolocation clicks, probably from dolphins. Um, and there, it's it's just this um, wonderful kind of uh, immersive sound that's happening, and you also hear um, a, a white noise. It's like a white noise, and that is kind of hissing. Gradually, gets more and more intense as you get further out and sort of deeper in, and that hiss is from the um, the either wind on the surface or rain on the surface of the ocean, and as the as the bubbles. Um, collapse upon themselves, then they create this incredible kind of background hissing sound in the ocean. So which we would think of as white noise. So here you see somebody listening to those headphones and looking out across the bay, thinking of, you know, the surface, what happens, how do we get beneath the surface, because we're so used to looking at surface and judging from surface itself, and not underneath. Okay. <clears throat> So this is, um, sorry, little distraction. Um, this is the, the lighthouse and the walk as you go out. Another important thing to um, recognize here is that they are um, 
open back headphones so they let in any sound that is happening around you so these are not closed headphones that that replace the sound with another they are the idea is to blend the two sounds the sound of the place that you're walking in whether it's the waves the gulls the boats the people walking past you your own footsteps on whatever material you're walking on all those things are combined with the sounds of the underwater yeah so you're asked by doing that to have this imaginative step where you place yourself in this underwater environment um, while your feet are still firmly on the ground. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're practicing this kind of what I think of as sort of sonic or augmented reality in a way. Um, so you're asked to stretch yourself beyond what you would normally, what you would normally do, but not just replace it with something else, but kind of um, expand your, your senses through these technologies. So that was Melt Me Into the Ocean. Um, I took these headphones again to different places. I was like, well, they're portable. What happens if I take these and listen to them in places that are not so site specific? So the Dundee one was really site specific for Dundee. Melt Me Into the Ocean <clears throat> was site specific for Santa Cruz. But what happens if I take them somewhere else completely? So I showed these at the Exploratorium in San Francisco, along with um a sound piece that i that was a surround sound piece and some video projection as it got dark but here it's on the san francisco bay um so you're again you're right on the water but you're not out looking out in the ocean um and people could listen to them here and as it got dark the projections on the on the ground and the buildings would come in and people could just come up and and take a pair of headphones and listen and then put them back and people would do that and um, kind of hang out talking with each other and listening at the same time so a kind of listening that's not super focused but kind of just expanding your sense of presence giving a sense of presence for something that otherwise you wouldn't be listening to and in doing that it changes how you experience the environment that you're in <clears throat> Yeah, it it um, makes you look differently. You see things differently um, when you hear something different. Yeah, it you know that's a standard kind of film th film theory idea that you know sound and image affect each other so much that you don't see the same thing if you hear something different. Yes, it, so so the two are, are totally affect each other. Um, so I then took these in various other places. These are just two examples. One was a piece in um, Lincoln, Nebraska, which is the very center, center, center landlocked place of um, America, North America, and um, a downtown in a city called Nebraska. Um, and you could put these headphones on and walk around the downtown. Um, and the other image is um, in Wupatki National Monument in Arizona, which is um, <clears throat> in the Navajo reservation there. And this is um, these these are people who could just uh, explore them by walking around in the desert. So part of what I was doing started to become very much about how do I take these sounds and place them in something somewhere else, and then what does that sort of dialogue um, how does that transform um, <clears throat> the place that we're in? So I wrote various things called listening to the ocean in the desert, for example, that were about that idea. Um, I want to, I think we've been going about an hour. So I want to move now to this piece called um, From a Whale's Back. I hear someone's unmuted. <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, so from a whales back um, was a piece that this is a, a rather larger project um, that emerged out of this work. And I decided that, okay, so we have a fixed hydrophone in the in the Monterey Bay, and I've been using that um, material. But I really liked that work with the sea glider that was really um, uh, in motion. Yes, it was a moving, um, a moving hydrophone. What could I, what would it be like if I could get moving hydrophone um, recordings, perhaps from whales themselves? And so I started researching whale tagging techniques that were being done. And I um, found that one of the main uh, researchers doing this happened to be at the University of Santa Cruz. So I contacted him, Ari Friedlander, and um, and he was extremely helpful uh, in the idea of trying to show this material in a very different way than the scientific analysis that they were doing. So he so, and, and his uh, students, graduate students in their lab, sorted through hours of material that they had from these tags that are placed on the backs of whales and handed me some uh, examples. I, I asked if there were some which would show um, other other animals, um, other of different kinds in the in the shot, um, and mainly facing forwards or slightly to the side, various different angles that I wanted. Um, and I then selected pieces of this of this material to create these um, immersive installations, which I'll, I'll go through now for you. So this is how they put the tag on. This is in Antarctica, the view from the boat. There goes the tag on the long pole. It is not a harpoon anymore. They're in a small rib and this is very slowed down, of course, to see. And then this is on at the back of a minke whale. So that is the view from the boat. <clears throat> this is the view from the tagger. The person tagging has a, a camera on their, on their head. So you see, it looks very different from whichever viewpoint you're on. And now I want to show you the view from the tag itself. So that moment when it reaches the whale's back and dives down is where the camera itself becomes our, um, our um, extension into this environment. Yes, our eye detaches from the boat, from the from the tagger to the tag and onto the whale's back. Um, and it's once you're in in this environment, seeing and listening through this through this uh, small device. Um, that you start to experience something that hasn't actually been seen before. So this is um, a tag that is attached by suction cups and it pops off after about 24 hours. And then the scientists have to try to retrieve it with um, with uh, um, the radio signals that it, that it that sends out. So it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually hurt the whales. Of course, the boat is chasing the whale and it has this little thing on its back, which other whales can see. And, you know, we don't know exactly how, in, how much it interferes with them, but it's very, it's considered very minimal at least. Um, <clears throat> so this is, the, I made, created four different videos, uh, f four five minute videos that play in a 20 minute loop. And I'd like to play just little samples of them for you. So this is um, humpbacks uh, swimming through jellyfish. Let's see. So that was um, with a soundtrack that I created, which has um, live electronics and theremin and um, 
uh, Celtic harp in there. So you're not hearing the sounds of the of the whale itself, but you're seeing um, the imagery of it as it surfaces and moves through. The next one is a pod of orcas swimming together in Antarctica. Um, actually, the installation has a fourth screen, which you can't see from here, but kind of behind the camera. So it's like um, a, a, a sort of a four screen uh, space that you're in. So let's uh, look at a little of this. And the sounds in this are directly from the camera, so there's no uh, edited sound or music in this at all. So, I mean, there are various things about this, the actual communication that's happening with the with the whales, the way that they are incredibly close together, often touching each other as they swim. Um, they swim at high speed. At some point, they really take off, and yet you cannot see. Uh, you, can, you can see how different it is when we surface, how far we can see in, in comparison to this underwater space, which is, you know, it's, it's like a dense fog. We think of it like that. So they're kind of kind of seeing through sound, if you like. Um, so that's that's the orcas. And then the next one is humpbacks bubble net feeding. This again is in the Monterey Bay. So bubble net feeding is um, they dive deep down and um, will come up in a circle, releasing bubbles like a spiral, releasing a jet of bubbles as they go, which which um, trap the fish, the school of fish within those bubbles like a net, um, and then they will come up and they, they do this as, as a group. So there are several whales doing this at once. Um, and that's how they, they catch these uh, schools of very small fish. Um, so here's some of that. It gets, they get very deep and it gets very dark. And you can also see <clears throat> the sea lions um, around them and seagulls and all the other animals that are also in on this one. So that's the bubble nets, as you can see, and it, it, there's a lot more to show on that. And you can see all of these on my website, the, you know, the longer versions of them, which I'd like you to see of them at some point. The, the last one here is the minke whales surfacing through ice. So again, this is an Antarctica. And in this piece, I included um, a soundtrack of um, harp. This is a, a pedal harp. Uh, combined with the sounds from the from the device. So again, this is like um, uh, a different kind of working with the sound.
so that's um those are the four videos and they're again they're more extensive if you watch them through um 20 minutes total 22 minutes total which i, I didn't want to spend that length of time during this um, lecture but uh it it would be great if you want to watch those you can go to my site <laughs> Yeah, so again, what does that make you make you how do, what does this make you feel about um, the issues that we're talking about listening remote sound, um, you know, technological intervention, viewing at a distance, um, our relationship to these species, these places. Um, many, many questions for me arise with this, this work, and it, it's not that I'm answering them, but that I'm more kind of sharing them and, and, and allowing you hopefully through the experience to to think about these ideas so um let's see i have a few more things that i'd like to show because i want to to go this was just early pandemic and i feel like the work that i'm doing now just to give you a sort of a, a look at it has a slightly different tone to it um, so let's see, I presented this paper and I'm not going to give the whole paper, but I'll take out pieces of it for you. <clears throat> um, at the University of Amsterdam this summer, there was a symposium called Oceans as Archives, which was also an extremely interesting symposium. And I recommend you take a look um, for their for their work. And I presented this, that unseen vibrance, listening to the ocean. And it was about built on a piece that I created called that unseen vibrance for the um, listening biennial, which were the first instance of it. Um, so again, created during lockdown. Um, and these ideas uh, really sort of started to formulate in, in a slightly different way, I think. So talking about the ocean orientation, Yes, I've mentioned that already. What happens if we can reorient our ideas to come from the ocean rather than the terrestrial? Yes, does that, you know, we're always looking at the ocean from land. What if we can do it the other way around? Yeah. And, um, you know, many uh, cultures actually do that already. And what happens if we can uh, try to understand a little more about that sense of orientation? So thinking of reorientation. Um, imagine an entwined sensory future of humans and ocean creatures, where our attentive, extended perception affects the world around us. So thinking of how we can relate to these creatures and these spaces, not as something other and distant, but as something entwined um, in our relationship. And bear in mind that our historical relationship with whales, for example, has been entwined in, um, for example, in that Dundee piece, and part of the symbolism of the, the braid was the entwining of those, um, of our histories and our cultures. Um, so it's the, it's the sort of what, how can we, how can we um, build that further? Um, this is a, Pacific white-sided dolphin that I found stranded on a beach on the north coast of, uh, on the California coast. Um, and I have here a, a quote from Rachel Carson, who has known the ocean, neither I, nor, neither you nor I with our earthbound senses. Um, how do we know, how can we possibly have an idea of understanding or relationship to another species that lives um, in the ocean and not on land? And here, this image to me, um, just this experience of watching the dolphin beach itself 
and trying to free it um, and watching it continuously come back up on the beach, continuously come back up on the beach. And here are the um, here are the Marine Mammal Centre um, uh, people who've come to take it away um, and to give it an autopsy. Um, you see, it's a similar size to a human. It just has um, a relation to us and yet something that is um, just, uh, you know, this coastline, everything about it was very, very poignant to me. So thinking about a reorientation, which I've uh, mentioned to before. Now, remember those early pieces I was talking to you about with the GPS? They were all about navigation and how to think of our place in the world as experience. Um, not just as specific location and this tension between data and experience and things like that. So um, there's that sense of orientation. There's also a sense of orientation to other species. And there's an, an, an orientation to um, intergenerational traumatic histories. And this comes through, um, uh, through our own human culture, but it also comes through our relationship to um, species such as whales that were hunted. Yes. So our relationship and their relationship to those traumatic histories, intergenerational trauma. So these have become kind of areas that I'm starting to be very, very interested in. Um, I, I won't read all of this, but this is a, um, just a, a quickly a reference from Sarah Ahmed's Queer Phenomenology, Orientations, Objects, Others. Um, and here she talks about um, a poet, Adrienne Rich, and um, her idea of, of orientation. So she's talking about who can come to the to start writing, start the process of writing. Um, and for some, having time for writing, which means time to face the objects upon which writing happens, becomes an orientation that is not available given the ongoing labor of other attachments, which literally pull you away. And in this case, she's talking about children that literally pull her away. So whether we can sustain our orientation toward the writing table, which is like the creative process, depends on our orientations, which affect what we can face at any given moment in time. So the idea that we can be oriented and pulled in many directions at the same time, um, and that we don't all experience the same um, sense of orientation. You know, in the middle of this paragraph, she says, attention involves a political economy or an uneven distribution of attention time between those who arrive at the writing table, um, which affects what they can do once they do arrive. And of course, many do not even make it. So um, attention, orientation, these, these who gets to who gets to have the privilege in a way of being able to actually do the creative process and create and, and spend time on attention. Yeah. So there are many um, areas in here that I think are really fascinating to think about, which brings us to attention and listening. For example, Pauline Oliveris is listening ma mantra. I'm listening to everything all the time. And I remind myself when I'm not listening, her ideas of global and focal attention. So the focal being locating a, a, a sound on something very specific, global would be listening to everything, trying to absorb everything all at once while you're listening. Um, so, uh, you know, how does this apply to recent research into the effects of ocean life? Um, it's still relatively unknown uh, sound pollution, if you like, in, in, in terms of in relation to other forms of ocean pollution. Um, the pandemic anthropause, which was a pause in human activity. It's been termed kind of the anthropause when there was the lockdown. I'm sure we've all you know, come across this term or at least the effect of it when everything became suddenly and significantly quieter. So this was it offered like a, a window on to possible sonic futures. Um, and I think most importantly, an opportunity to reflect back and hear ourselves more clearly. So what are the implications of that sort of that little slice of quietness that we had? Um, I was in, I'm interested in shells and grief. Um, this is during the pandemic, my, my mother died the other side of the world. And when I finally managed to get to see my father two years later, he had collected on her table, he had collected 
a mound of shells from the beach. He would walk through his grief. He would walk every day on the beach and collect four shells for her. And it creates this huge, um, huge mound. Um, so thinking of sound as the harbinger of a renewed relatedness to the environment. Um, again, more on listening. So listening is not exclusive from the other senses. It's a form of reorientation. Think of listening as intergenerational, so not just located in the here and now, but something that crosses generations and um, interspecies. And this image is um, a, a set of a small abalone called um, uh, Haliotis or sea ear or mermaid ear in Spain. My brother collected all of these during the pandemic, again, shell collecting. This I found during the pandemic on the north coast, on the California coast here, names, um, uh, and it's a uh, red abalone, it's enormous. Um, and it reminds me of a, a, a work by Michael Tausig, What Color is the Sacred? And he talks about this term polymorphous magical substance as um, color. Names of colors leaping from the page in a sighing and a soaring of sound. So again, the relation between something like color and sound, I think is really interesting. So beyond human scale, how do we understand something that's so out of our, out of our human experiential scale, a, away from our physiology? Um, how do we relate in scale? And here, just to show you the size of that abalone shell, you see it in relation to the dog. Um, how can we have whole body experiences of sound that are sounds that are beyond the human scale? Can we can we create that in some way? So not just ears addressing the ears, but addressing the 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 the, the body within these experiences. Um, at this, I'm using this as a kind of a conclusion, so I'm wrapping up now. Um, thinking of Whale Dundee and Melt Me Into the Ocean as uh, working with sort of intergenerational trauma and healing, these two pieces were really important in uh, bringing me into that sort of zone. Um, well, I've talked about Whale Dundee and Melt Me Into the Ocean. Um, this is a quote from Cynthia Chow uh, on the or Orang Suku Lao seascape, and it's in a, in a book called Tide Electics. Um, and based on the um, Polynesian uh, area, which is really related to the ocean and the sea and, and their movements through it. And she says here, truths inherent in the ocean will be revealed to humans only if humans advance their sensory education to decode the wealth of oceanic experiential data. So the idea that we have to advance our sensory education, and I think learning to listen is part of this, and it's not just learning to identify specific sounds, that is part of it, but learning to um, sort of update, reload, reorient our sensory, our sensory capabilities in relation to spaces, in relation to technologies, in relation to science um, uh, and other species. Um, and in, that, in, in a sense of oceanic experiential data that we can get. So we talked about um, from a whale's back. Um, tagged animals, I wanted to mention the idea of tagged animals. And um, this is from Helen MacDonald, a writer, writer um, British writer, um, a piece called The Arrow Stalk. And she talks about tagging elephant seals here. The notion of autonomous biological sampling devices confuses the distinctions between technology and living organisms, quietly erasing the animal's agency. So what are these tags doing to the animals and our relationship to them? Enabling us to see and experience, but are they erasing the animal's agency? What's, what's actually happening here? Um, it's, it's really intriguing um, ideas in that. So the last piece I want to show you here is um, a piece on Scrimshaw. So I've become more and more interested in whaling history, like I said, these intergenerational histories. Um, and bones, shells, children, generations, all these things come into these ideas. Um, 
and talk about tra trauma and healing across species and across generations. Um, how would you set up a truth and reconciliation com commission for marine mammals, for example? Um, so these are um, uh, artificial, the, the white pieces that you see up there are artificial bones that are skull bones for children for, that I um, was given from um, a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, who the, the children are all now healthy. Um, but these are the three implants. So they're 3D printed pieces in the shape of the child's original skull. Um, uh, actually, one of them is my daughter's skull. So this was a whole part of, uh, of uh, life for me in the last few years. So I developed this relationship with the surgeon to try to explore a little bit further what this process was. I was very interested in the ideas of bone and um, they're very lightweight. And um, and I was interested in scrimshaw, which is this, uh, I, I, many people in England are very familiar with what scrimshaw is, but in other parts of the world, they've not heard of it. But it's really uh, the process of carving onto bones that uh, sailors on the whaling ships would have done in their spare time when and they had little bits of whalebone around and they would carve like a folk carving folk tradition of carving uh, whale scenes or uh, women or you know different different things onto these um, little uh, pieces of whalebone um, then you can see them in in different collections in museums and things now so i was thinking what happens if i can create um, scrimshaw on these child um, head head skulls 3D printed skulls. So I then created molds of them and um, carved in, these are wax molds with, with scrimshaw images of the whales from those whale tagging videos from underwater onto these bones. And then I cast them into bronze. So you can now hold these pieces and they're very heavy and they have um, these, these kind of folk carvings into them. So I'm thinking, I'm imagining the intimacy of this handheld, this handheld thing, this handheld bone that in this case is a human child rather than a whale, a piece of whale. Yes. Um, and what, imagine the intimacy of the handheld as it shifts in scale from whale. Yeah. So we're, sh we're shifting the scale and holding something. Does that change our intimacy and our understanding of it? And then this piece with the bronze is um, taking data from this is uh, from the whale tags the data of the the bubble net feeding dive so this spiral um, in 3D space and then create just creating it into uh, a bronze piece that you can hold so the the one on the left here the larger image is a humpback bubble net feeding uh, trace track and the one on the right is a sea lion that is um is asleep and it drops down in the water and then as it goes into rem sleep it does this little spiral and it spins down and then it comes out of rem sleep and it and it, and it goes up again in the water column so these two things that you can kind of hold and turn are really part of that so um the last piece that i won't play you today because i want to have time for conversation is the piece called that unseen vibrance which is a 20 minute piece that i created for the um the the listening biennial um which was based in berlin uh in 2021 and that unseen vibrance so the tam tam has a resonance that seems to grow beyond itself taking off in swells of full spectrum sound it is more pushed than struck and here i play it by staying within its own resonant rhythm in the gongs swells, I hear the waves. And so I recorded curling rollers of the Pacific. Like the gong and the waves, when I play the harp, the sound vibrates through my body. So I placed microphones inside the instrument to capture both its resonance and shimmer. In gong, waves, harp, and particularly in their combination, I experience a sense of entrainment to the sounds. Through them, I think I can hear all sounds. You might recognize this place of sustaining, a crossing, an orientation, a migration, asylum. 
that unseen vibrance. So I am going to stop there and, and take any questions. Thank you, Yolandi. That was amazing. <laughs> it's great to get such a, a sense of how um, how your kind of life, like in and within the sea, has built this huge practice and, and knowledge as well. It isn't necessarily pinned to, to land and the terrestrial eye or ear. And um, so it's lovely to hear about that. And I, I've kind of, I've written a huge amount of different notes around things, but thinking about sound is not sound alone and disorientation mm -hmm. as a kind of practice or a methodology within um, issues of climate damage and anthropogenic climate change is like super interesting. Maybe we can come into, and also the ocean as an archive and the body as an archive as well. Um, mm -hmm. within these discussions, I was kind of having lots of, um, lots of ideas and revelations, but let's, um, let's go through the chat first. And then again, everyone just, you can obviously like you always do just keep popping questions in the chat as we go. Um, and we'll pick them up and then I will also ask some as well. So I think, I think we might have answered one of them in the presentation, the first one, which was oh, actually, maybe we didn't. Raul asked what the device was called. Um, and I think this is a very early work that may have even been about picking up more kind of electromagnetic frequencies, perhaps. Um, which piece was that about? I'm sorry, I couldn't access my chat. My, my cursor kept disappearing and I, I didn't want to keep stopping sharing to check in the chat. So um, sorry um, about that. Raul, if you pop in the chat what piece that was about, that would be very, very helpful because this is now sort of nearly uh, two hours in, so I, I also don't have that <laughs> in, my, in my memory. Oh, here we go, maybe this is it. Um, taking, taking soundings, um, navigating, was it? Na navigating, navigating by circles. Okay, so um, that, the, the device that you were looking through, yes, that's called the sextant. <clears throat> Oh, I think I sent it to Sound Arts. I want to send it to everyone. Sorry. It's called the sextant, um, and it's celestial navigation techniques, basically. Um. <clears throat> oh, the Stein device. Ah, that was um, that was something that I built using um, using things called the gum sticks. I don't know if they still exist. Um, that was the little processor, computing processor with the uh, with the um, GPS and the sound um, the sound capability on it. Um, it was called Sun Run Sun. Was that piece? Right. Thank you. Um, there was some great comments around the, the Mississippi work as well, and, and people saying how much they enjoyed the sort of phantom sounds and Ryan's comments on this, and also um, discussion about whether the recordings were processed, which I think. Mm -hmm. that and, and said that they weren't. Um, yeah. Do you, do you do that kind of, do you manipulate the sort of source sounds ever or are you, is there a sort of strategy there? Hardly ever. I, I um, really love to find sounds that appear like, they're, they're so ambiguous that you think, how could that be? You know, I've heard that, I've, you know, we, it, it's sort of playing on our, on our habitual listening, you know, we we hear sounds so much that we imagine that they're all manipulated because that's how sounds are, yeah. So we, even perhaps we don't even really think about it. Um, so I like it when I find sounds that um, that surprise in that they are not manipulated, like the pink noise piece, those sounds of the engines that was not edited together. That's really how that five minute section was was. It was just very loud and these incredible different sounds and the same with that that Mississippi piece the Mississippi tornado piece is um that's what it sounded like at least through the microphone it was so surprising mm -hmm. thank you um <clears throat> another question about what kind of microphone did you use but again I'm not sure what the the piece is that we're talking about here um so <clears throat> through that for now um Lisa asked about was there a, a mic on the whales on the tag, and then Lisa answered 
her own question. <laughs> yes, there, so on those tags, there are, is, a, is a high definition video camera, which they're starting, I think, to replace, would try to replace with a 360 camera, which would be really interesting. And um, hydrophone, high definition hydrophone on there. And, you know, you hear with those tags, uh, and the more you watch those, that they, you hear all the sound of when it, when it bangs through the surface of the water and it fills up with bubbles and it's, you know, it's, it's distorting because they suddenly move so fast that it gets a, you know, really a lot of pressure on it. So, and I keep those things in the, in the piece because I think that's interesting to, to be hearing the device in itself. You know, you're constantly reminded that, yeah, I'm, I'm not watching a movie where I'm asked to be kind of taken with it without thinking. I'm asked also to be thinking about the process at the same time through the sound. Yeah, that came across very strong, actually. And it reminded me of certain things in, um, let's say, sensory ethnography or sensory cinema in the sense of, and, and again, linking back into sort of disorientating or reorientating the image and thinking about that through sound. and Yeah particularly like re reorientating these traditions of the, the, the pristine underwater recording and actually yeah. what you showed us was all this kind of anthropogenic noise that's entangled in that mediation and um, I thought that was that was really like compelling as a as a method and a strategy and clearly it's something that you're deploying like as a as a thing <laughs> yeah yes right yeah right okay. um, Simon's got a question uh, regarding connection to place you've traveled around a lot doing really interesting works. Um, what have you discovered about doing work where you live? Are you melt me in the ocean in a space that you can get to know intimately over a period of time? Is there any difference there? Yeah, I think so. And I, I'm glad you asked it, Simon, because you know it, it also relates to the life of a of a an artist. Yeah. And um, for most of, in fact, the, nearly the entire of my adult life until I moved to Santa Cruz, I kept moving. And um, it was part of being unrooted in a way that enabled me to do the work and gave me a lot of uh, fuel, if you like, inspiration to, to find new ideas and find new things. And then being um, here in Santa Cruz now six years, I've really started to feel a sense of place and location in a way that I did perhaps when I was a child growing up on the south coast of England in Devon. Um, and it's it's become, I just think, really important. You know, sensing a place over a longer period of time is something that I have always wanted to do and yet never been able to do. So. You know, I, I'm kind of part of part of the world. There are so many people with so many different experiences, but there are so many people in the world that are displaced and that are moving constantly and not in the place of their um, of their home. Yeah, having to create new homes in different places and try to understand what that even might mean is 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 really interesting to me. So. Um, yeah, what, what, um, you know, what have I discovered about doing work where I live? Um, the more I, you know, it, it's one of those things that I do, I do work here and I walk the beach every day. Yeah, the same, be the same beach, not almost every day, but you know, it, it's absolutely regular. And I see it change, I see it transform. And that is something that you don't get if you're constantly moving about. So um, I definitely think that there's a there's a depth to the work that that changes. There's a sense of reflection. I don't, I mean, these may sound a little vague at this stage, but it's more on those levels, I think. Um, and yes, there's a lot of engagement with the actual people involved and the, you know local groups and 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 connection like that that is made that is not there if you keep moving. So that is also interesting to me. Now, I don't know if that answers your question, Simon. But... Thank you. That was great. Okay. Thanks, Simon. Um, great question from Leslie, who also says, thank you for the wonderful lecture. Um, and this was towards the end of the talk, which was such an enticing proposition. How would you set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Marine Mammals? Um, 
or is that is that like a is that do you feel like that's a real task is it a fictional task is it all of the above i think it's something that we need to ask because we we need to ask it in human culture yeah um you know i live here talking about local place i live here in a place of indigenous um, tribal land that is you know steeped in that question how can reconciliation be be made with these tribes that have had their lives completely devastated um and so you know we're and i grew up in the time of the south african truth and reconciliation commission um so it's something that is so powerful and so important and so relevant. And what if we look beyond the species of human to other species and, you know, it, it reaches to the planet, it reaches to um, the ocean rivers, whatever it is that is so, so taking it beyond um, the human. I think that's where that question comes from. So to, to pick something like marine mammals, how would you do that? If you think of them as um, cultural uh, beings, how could we, how could we do that? How can we reconcile what we did to them? Yeah. Um, and that, that just intrigues me. I think it's so important. And part of the Dundee piece was trying to give them voice. Yes. Um, obviously who knows if that could actually happen, but I think it, as an approach, it's interesting. Yeah, that piece in particular struck me when, with when this came up, and um, thinking about repatriation as well, and, and sonic repatriation as, as mm -hmm. something that underpins this um, um, this reconciliation. Sort mm -hmm. of and also, yeah. I guess tapping into like a lot of current debates on the rights of nature and and these yep. types of look into that, which is um, yeah, it's like a, such a huge, brilliant kind of uh, enticing topic that's really important as well so yeah yeah thank you for that response lisa has a question um how did you learn what you were listening to on the santa cruz hydrophone um generally to the hydrophones you listened to did you already have this mental library of underwater sounds crackling crustaceans blue water rumbles or did you learn what you were listening to from someone else that's such a cool question um also, what's the location this is at? Did you say the mic could be listening to generally open access? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Lisa. So, um, so you, I learned a lot about underwater sound. I wouldn't be able to know what any of those sounds were without learning about them. And this is one of the things for researchers, listening to these hydrophones and listening to sounds that they don't know what they are. Yeah, when, when um, humpback whales were first heard it was really during the cold war in the 1950s when they had um, listeners to these underwater microphones and they were listening for submarines uh, and submarine activity but actually they were hearing all these strange sounds and what were they and that was when they discovered that they were whales and so the silent ocean of like um of Cousteau Jacques Cousteau the silent world that he'd called it bearing in mind he was somebody who spent at least 50% of his entire life underwater. I mean, he's about as close as you can get. He called it the silent world. And, um, and so, so, so the, it's, it has a history, the sort of discovery of what these sounds actually are. And there are so many sounds that, that are not known yet. So it, it, to do that, I had to go to um, scientists and then there are, there are various different um, places that you can find, um, find those things. Um, yeah, you you can quite easily find the sort of categories of these sounds, and then you then you start to recognize them, and I think that's really useful and helpful to do. So you have a kind of basic vocabulary of of what's known about sounds and who's making them and how they're made and why they're making them or why we think they're making them, those kind of things. Um, and then. Um, as your question about what location it is. So let me type in, I don't have the actual um, web address handy with me, but Mbari is the group, Monterey Bay. I'll just put it in the chat, Aqu aquarium. Let me spell aquarium right. <laughs> um, research 
Institute. <clears throat> and they have, if you look up them and they have um, <clears throat> the hydrophone, you can find the hydrophone section and you can listen live now. They also are allowing in the last year or so they've they've released the data for anybody to listen to. So it is open, which is really good. I'm really happy with that. Um, they also have other sections on free sound. For example, you can look up Mbari on free sound and find some some of their um, selections. <clears throat> And I mean, I didn't give it have a chance to show you other hydrophone projects around the world. There are many different ones that you can also look into if you're interested and, and live listen on maps and things like that. So they're fun. Thank you. Um, Vane asks um, a personal question in, in some ways. What's the main transformation in your life when working with recording and analyzing these special whale sounds? What, how do you feel and what is the main transformation in your life when working with recording and analyzing special whale sounds? Hmm. <laughs> That's such an interesting question. I'm not sure how to answer it really. I mean, one of the things I do feel is completely captivated and not wanting to stop. I mean, that's like the main the main thing that's striking me. Let me see if I can get rid of the sun quickly. Oops, no, I can't do that. You just have to put up with the sun. I like the sun. Um. Yeah, I love the way that the light has just <laughs> dramatically. It's brilliant. It's kind of, but I can't see my screen. Does that help a little bit? Not really. No, it didn't help. Okay. <laughs> Hang on a second. Maybe that's a bit better. Not really. Okay. No, I'm just, no, I'm just underwater. You see, I'm under ripples. <laughs> um, yeah, so so I think that, um, I think that there's certainly just a sense of complete captivation of, of, of that sound. And um, I have always been like that since a child, very easily um, <laughs> drift into my imagination. So I get taken by sounds and I just, I'm, I'm off quite easily. So very easily. So that is, um, you know, part of it for me. But um, I think that the more I listen, the more I want to listen. Um, uh, the more important I think it is to listen to it. Um, and the more intrigued I am by how uh, it can weave into my own life. Yeah which sounds a bit strange, but that's really why I'm doing all this because I'm fascinated by that. How how does it come into my own music making, for example, which is one of the reasons I'm including the harp in there um, and other electronic sounds, uh, it, because I'm interested in how we make, how we make music, what music is for and, and, in, and where that line between sound and music and other animals is is part of that. So I, music has come more into the fore. I've let it in more in the recent years. I think partly because of these underwater sounds, um, particularly the whale sounds, there's something about it that that is, um, it seems to, seems to require it in my mind. It's as if a, a more dry analysis of sound is just not enough. Um, yeah. It's some kind of an answer, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you. It kind of links into Simon's um, question. Simon asks again around ambiguity. I find this interesting because in one of the pieces, I assumed the sound was a real whale, and then you explained it was a theremin. I like this too. I'm wondering how you decide when to introduce a compositional element. Yeah, that's a good question. How, how and when do I decide? Um, I wish there was a really concrete answer to that, but, but there is not. Um, I do decide, though. You know, I often tell my students to be a, an artist of any kind is is constant decision making. Yeah, you are making decisions the entire time. Um, so nothing is nothing is completely without that, I think. Um, there are times when I, um, what I do, the process that I go through is I have image and I have sound and I am I, I will play, uh, there will be pieces that I play over and over again. And if I want to see them more, or I want to hear them more, then I will keep doing it. Yeah. And 
the ones that stick don't get tiring to me. Yeah, but there are other pieces that will just fall by the wayside and I'll never look at them again after a few plays. But the ones that stick just keep going and then I will just go through this process of putting them together in different ways, just allowing them to play while I'm doing something or I'm just watching them and listening to them. And, and at some point there will be something about them that put in the right in the right uh, combination something kind of i can't describe it as other, other than some kind of click or magic happens and then i think oh yeah that has to go with that and it's um it's not something i could predict in advance i i don't feel like i c can go out saying i know i want to combine this image and this sound it's much more um sort of finding these things and playing around with them in the process of playing around with them that these these things will come together and then something new happens Um, we've got about five minutes left in questions are still coming, so we'll, we'll try and get through them. Um, Tom asks, or, or says, and then asks, very exciting ideas about navigation and how technologies can expand our sense of place. I'm wondering about mobile mapping softwares like Google Maps and how they affect our relationship to space around us. Do you feel a distinction between these technologies that sort of take over our navigation abilities and those that could support, engage, or expand them, like those in your work? And maybe how these technologies relate to body disembodiment it's a very brilliant and big question yeah i mean i think that's really what i'm being interested in all this time i mean uh, you talk about sort of taking over our navigational abilities and one of the, the those early works were really inspired by that you know early gps was coming in and people were getting completely lost and driving into lakes by mistake and you know <laughs> because their, what it was doing was literally replacing their sense of orientation saying, you know, I know that I've driven down this road and therefore I'm going west or I'm, you know, I've seen a landmark passing me or I know I'm driving around in circles because I've passed this place before, you know, whatever it is. These are just like the basic way of, of, of relating to our environment, which is, you know, that is our, our basic sense of orientation, yes, and moving through space was taken away and replaced in the extreme, replaced by the GPS, which does it for us. And I think now it's got to a stage where it's so um, fast and accurate and the, you know, for example, Google Maps now has so much information on it. And, you know, you can do all sorts of things that you, that you can't do otherwise. You can check the traffic in a certain time of day when you want to, you know. I mean, there are, there are these things that, that are really, really useful. They're beyond, kind of um, orienting in space they're a really useful tool yeah um so i think that's that's interesting but i'm i'm just so interested in you know our our experience and how to not to lose our our abilities yeah but to keep enhancing them yeah to in, use these to technologies to keep it enhancing what we're doing how we're learning in space and how we move through it rather than shutting things down I think that's where technology is really interesting. Um, that's great, thank you. Derek asks a question which I'm going to save to the end because it's it's an epic question. So <laughs> I'm going to go to Joe's and then come back to Derek's for our for our grand finale. Um, so Joe asks, um, really enjoyed your thoughts comparing seeing or hearing into the distance. Do you think that basically as sound recorders we have to wait for the sound to come to us or to our microphones? And therefore, it is a less invasive practice somehow than filming. Very interesting. Do you have any thoughts on the balance between research and invasiveness into nature? Thank you for a great talk. Hmm. Yeah, well, I have a lot of thoughts on all those things. Um, you know, there's, there's obviously some effort involved in recording and you have to go out and you have to get your equipment and be in a certain place in a certain time with a certain microphone. Yeah. So you are already, um, I, I think of that as, as editing already. Yeah. It, that's where the process begins. You're not happening to be in just in the right place at the right time all the time. Yes. Yeah? So you're, you're, you're making choices always at the beginning. Um, but yeah, I do think there's a, there's a, an element of, waiting for the sound to come to us as you describe it or to the microphones that is 
is interesting and and of course you know once you right if you've been into a forest for example and there's suddenly there's no sound or they're just birds doing their alarm calls and then if you sit there for 30 minutes or more then it all it shifts back and your presence isn't so disruptive and and you can start to you know be in a space that that is that is you know more your presence then is not so invasive yeah um I don't know quite how that is with underwater sound. I mean, uh, yeah, just a passive, what they call passive acoustic monitoring, where you just have a microphone and you're just listening is one way. Instead of putting sounds out into the environment, that's that's less invasive. Um, um, I'm doing a research project, starting a project on uh, John Cage's mycology collection, which is the special collections are here in UC Santa Cruz. Um, so he was a, a fungus expert, fungi, and um, I'm interested in mycelium networks and various things like that. And one of the quotes from him, and I don't remember it exactly, but it's basically um, saying like finding ideas is like finding mushrooms. They they appear. You have to you have to sort of zone in on them, and then they appear in certain ways. Um, and and so you, it, it, in a way that just reminds me a little. How do you find those sounds that you're looking for? You can't make them happen. So you have to be open to chance in in that sense. Um, yeah, I don't know, Joe, if that answers some of your question. Thanks, Yolanda. That's brilliant. Okay, let's get to Derek's um, final question. So question around listening to environments that many modern, modern humans in cities aren't exposed to. I think there's a need to be exposed to our planet's vast ecosystem, and I believe sound is a powerful tool for it. Do you also think that sound can be a tool for environmental change? Well, I'd like to say yes. Um, uh, I, I really would like to say yes. And, um, you know, I think that it's a really important tool for environmental change, but it requires us to completely shift our expectations and our orientations because sound is not really something that has, <laughs> I mean, you can't expect results in the same way uh, somehow. It's not tangible. It's an approach. It's about relationship. Yeah. So it's about shifting our relations to others, to other space, spaces, other species. And that shift, I think, is really, really crucial. Um, so, yeah, and I think of sound as as a um, as a tool to do that, as a way to shift our emphasis, to shift our focus um, off um you know, objects and control and things like that onto much more relational um, ways of, of trying to find, manage problems and manage situations globally, you know. And so that may be very broad uh, answer, but I, I do, I do think so. And, you know, the, the question about listening to these environments when so many of us live in cities, yeah, in urban environments. And I think that's really interesting. I, I also, um, think that, you know, young people, particularly growing up now with digital equipment are, uh, and the whole rise of, of, of VR, for example, um, enables us to go into those spaces much more easily, especially if we're in urban environments, than um, into the spaces of, of um, you know, the so-called natural world, yeah. Um, so I think that those those issues need to be really constantly brought to the fore. I, I often say to myself and to my students that it feels irresponsible to be teaching digital media, digital media art, without um, acknowledging and teaching about the environment at the same time. So, um, yeah, I, I, we could keep discussing. I know it's 8.33, I'm <laughs> That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to have to leave it there, Yolandi. Just a huge, huge thank you again. That was a wonderful talk, and um, I think we've all learned heaps, and we'll no doubt be checking out so much more of your work online as well. So thank you very much, and thank you, everyone, for all those brilliant questions.
um, we'll keep the chat open a little bit to just sort of say bye and thanks, I guess. And um, All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming and listening and participating in the questions. And I am, you know, I'm on email. If you have further questions or want to follow up, I'm, I always like to do that. So thanks for, for inviting me. Thanks. Mm-hmm.